Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 785. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's January 31st, 2023. All right, welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could be here either for the live YouTube cast or the recorded YouTube cast or the podcast. We're glad you could listen in. This is a great opportunity to, to donate something to Anglican TV, and we ask that you donate your likes. If you see the like button on YouTube or Facebook, what a great opportunity for you to say, I'm going to make sure Kevin and George get free advertising. So click that like button. Go to the comment section. That's where the show continues. We've had just a tremendous amount of comments over the last three or four shows with all that's been going on in the Church of England and around the world. We appreciate that. We appreciate the story ideas. We appreciate any updates or corrections. George, how are you doing today? I am doing great. Busy weekend. Uh, had our annual meeting, elected a new vestry, presented the budget, went over last year's numbers with the attendance and income. Uh, we're not back where we once were. We're where we were before COVID. And mm -hmm. we have four main services over the weekend. Two were about at, at the same level as 2019, pre-COVID. Uh, but two were still far from where we should be. The uh, 1030, the main service, we're still missing 50 bodies. And the Saturday evening service, we're missing 20 bodies. So our, you know, we were at 275. Uh, before COVID, now we're down to 200, 200. We were at 100 last year, so we doubled in one year. <laughs> Good. Uh, but uh, I guess people cr crawled out of the cave and looked at, we're like uh, the uh, groundhog. We look out to see whether the I can see our shadow and they're out. But, gosh, I, I shouldn't get so obsessed about numbers, but it's one of the few metrics that I can track uh, on uh to basically gauge the health of the church that and the other is income and people tell me you shouldn't be so people fixed and money fixed and you should be on the spirit well yes we focus on the spirit but how do i know where we're going and what where we're, we're going you do need management tools well that's what i like something i mean uh, archbishop duncan had a great metric he would always use he said you judge a church by its adult baptisms if your church is truly operating and truly, you know, working within the spirit, all the other stuff is good. Don't get me wrong, but you know, the the ultimate me metric would be adult baptisms. Like, oh, we feel well, that one. <laughs> I mean, you know, I I have uh, two. I have four parishioners in jail right now. I mean, we we track That's that bad. metric. How many That's of our <laughs> active parishioners are currently in prison, mm -hmm. detained at the pleasure of the state of Florida or the, or the local county? Yeah. So, well, maybe that's a good one because we are reaching out to the, the prisoners. We just happen to be producing some of them. But uh. Well, I mean, you, any metric of a church should be the metric of what a church looked like in the first and second and third centuries, you know, where it was there to truly serve the poor, the widows. And, you know, that was part of that metric of how it grew so fast, fast in that century is there's actually a place you can go uh, worship God be baptized, live a uh, holy and righteous life that is so unpagan, because they would look at the pagan culture and say, "I don't like that. That don't look good. That ain't where I want to go." And boy, we have that same opportunity in this day and age to be completely the opposite of the culture. And th the culture now is as pagan, as gnostic as it ever has been. I would say more so with uh, critical race theory and all this uh, wokeness going around, but that's just me. George, let's move on. Yeah, well, go it's not just you, Kevin. Um, I think so much of it is that people aren't aware of, well, for instance, my daughter, uh, who lives in Seattle, she's not an active churchgoer. She's a, she's a Christian, but she's in that age in her 20s where she's wandered away. She does go to church once a week. She goes to the cathedral in Seattle, where they have yoga classes. And I say to her, you know, Bunny, be careful with yoga because each of these yoga positions represents a particular Hindu god or goddess. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, it's one thing for stretching and relaxation, but for those who really get deep into yoga, it is demonic. 
And of course, the cathedral in Seattle would be hosting a demonic <laughs> yoga place. <laughs> Why not? Hey. Now, of course, I'm gonna we're gonna get letters. Yoga isn't demonic. Well, let's get it all out. Don't be a Freemason. Don't yeah. do yoga. Do, uh, yoga. You know, let, let's just uh, go through all the things <laughs> that get people upset with us. Yeah. Well. Oh my. But we 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 have to live into this reality of the culture we're in, and to be sure, at the end of the day, people can identify us as something separate from the culture. They need to be identified. The church is salt and light, separate from abortion separate from uh, sadomasochism, se separate from pornography, separate from all the stuff going on. The, the, you just turn on your TV now. There's a, 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 I was reading an article, there's a new show called M MILFs or something where uh, women are doing dating, like a dating show, where they're looking for 20-year-old men. That's gross. I saw, uh, <laughs> actually, there was a... Uh, the Ingram angle, a Laura Ingraham, Ingram angle, yeah, okay, yeah, 10 yeah. o'clock. So she has a uh, contributor who is a, uh, who's the anchor for EWTN, Eternal Word Network. Uh, um, and he did a little, he did a little blurb on this. And what is doubly gross is that they invited these young men and then they invited these women and they didn't tell each other that the young men were all the sons of the women they invited. And so in essence, they're dating the guy's <sighs> mom. I mean, we're really talking sicko land here. That's, that, I did not see that. Uh, you just ruined my whole breakfast, George. <laughs> All right, cool. We should move on to the news before we can become the news. Uh, George, we have lots of stories. I got eight stories across the world. Dias of the Southern Cross, led by uh, Glenn Davies, now has a new parish joining them that has a female rector. Now, for people who remember uh, what goes on down in down under and in the diocese of Sydney, they don't allow women clergy. I got that correct, mm -hmm. right? Okay, priests. They have priests. women deacons. Deacons? Uh, Not sure. Deaconesses? Something like Deacon, that. Deaconesses. No, that's, okay. Correct us if we're wrong. Uh, so. You know, to start up uh, a province, you kind of have to go outside the outside the comfort zone, George. Yeah, they're drawing their parishes uh, mostly from the Queensland area, and uh, they've got a new congregation. And I saw this on Facebook. And see, in Australia, in the Sydney tradition, they don't use the words we're familiar with, rector, victor, um, vicar. I'm sure they do, but they like to say, you know, the senior minister. And the senior minister of this new church, part of the Diocese of the Southern Cross, is a woman. Is she a deaconess? Is she a priest? I'm assuming she's a priest because they have communion at this church and they're not into lay communion. And mm -hmm. you know, So if you guys know what the details are, I th I'd be fascinated to hear because is if you're starting with, you've got three or four parishes now, and if a third of your clergy are women at the start, I think it's setting the direction which way you're going on the issues of women orders. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, interesting that uh, Sydney is not in favor of this, but their new plant, the ACNA Information in Australia, is uh, starting at the very ground levels with the equality of women clergy. The complementarian evangelical position is not the position apparently of this new diocese so it's interesting it's interesting and this is the one topic george and i do not give our opinion on uh, we don't want to lose half our audience one way or the other we try to report it as straight as we can um and in as such uh we just find this interesting in this day and age within the uh new anglicanism revolt going on so yeah, because Kevin and I have learned the lesson of uh, losing members because we don't believe in Marian apparitions, losing yeah, members because we attack yoga, <laughs> losing yeah. viewers because we're in. We don't think Freemasons should be. Uh, Freemasonry is good. Do, we think don't even get me it. started on the Fatima fraud. Yeah, yeah. I mean we don't want to you know, lose any any people because of that. Um, we got two 
Episcopal Church store is coming up. Uh, and we've reported on this before. Uh, right now in Wisconsin, my home state, uh, three dioceses are trying to merge together and should be able to do that within the next five years because attendance in those churches is dwindling. I know that we have this now happening in the Indianapolis, Indiana area, George? Is yeah, right? uh, as you mentioned, uh, there are a number of dioceses that are discussing merger or they're in de facto mergers. Northwestern Pennsylvania, which is ERA, as shares a bishop with Buffalo, Western New York. Uh, Eastern Michigan and Western Michigan share a bishop. Uh, Eastern Oregon and Oregon I may not share a bishop, but the, basically Eastern Oregon is, you know, dying on the vine. Yeah. And now Indianapolis and Northern Indiana are discussing how they can go together. Each uh, Doug Sparks and uh, Jennifer Baskerville, Baskerville Burroughs are the bishops there. They've both been there since, I think, 2015. And they've been discussing what the future brings. Northern Indiana has lost a quarter of its members uh, since uh, since Bishop Sorry, Sparks, I think, yeah. came in. Yeah. And uh, Indianapolis has lost maybe 15, 20%. They're both down. Income is down. And is there a way to merge these two dioceses so that when one or both of them retire, we re we come back to the Diocese of Indiana. We're going to see this, uh, Kansas and Western Kansas. Um, if Springfield were not so conservative, they would have long ago been sucked back into the Diocese of Chicago and become the old Diocese of Illinois That's right. 100 plus years ago. Well, th but we're it's going back in time. We're going back in time yeah. here. You know, what, the healthy diocese of the 1970s are now the diocese of the 1910s and 1920s, George. Uh, maybe. Well, it's part of it is the migration factor. Uh, mm -hmm. North Dakota and South Dakota have always been tiny. Uh, and the carrying costs for being a bishop are so high that either you have to do what Eau Claire did for a while, which is have a retired priest be the bishop, so he doesn't have to draw a salary. Um, but, you know, but in Florida, you know, we've gone from one diocese to five dioceses, and we could conceivably, you know, my deanery and our neighboring deanery could form a diocese that would be bigger than the combined diocese of uh, Indiana. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, but uh, in other words, where there's growth, Texas is growing, uh, Florida is growing, is geographic areas and populations. Um, where, is the Episcopal Church growing in some spots? Not in others. For instance, you, you spoke about, uh, there's, you know, theoretically, there should be no need for an ACA church in Tampa because the bishop in southwest Florida is a good fellow and he's not swallowed the Kool-Aid. Yet, that uh, the the odor of the Episcopal Church is such that for some people they just won't go there, no matter if the local church is sound, good preaching, good teaching, wonderful people, this and that. They are tarred by what other people do. So, we'll yeah, see. I mean, there's this dynamic in an ACNA church. Early on, when the ACNA was formed, it was formed with uh, post Episcopalians. I used to go to an Episcopal church. I had to leave you know, for this reason or that reason, and they joined the. I ACA. thought the sheriff got. I thought the sheriff took you out of that building. <laughs> the the sheriff, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, for whatever reason, we didn't want to go to the Episcopal church anymore. We joined an ACNA church, and we we like it very much. That was ten years ago. Now, when you go to a, your average ACNA church, uh, the people who there are not post or ex. Episcopalians. They that they started that church. They went to the church. They came from a Southern Baptist or a Presbyterian or a Methodist. They were not automatically just ex uh, tech. Um, mm -hmm. Now at the new church I'm going to in Tampa, there are people there who are ex tech because they had no other choice, you know, to go to um, over the last ten years. This is kind of a, a new Anglican uh, ACNA entity 
uh, within Tampa. And so uh, I was talking to three or four people last week, and yeah, we used to go to the Episcopal Church. We're here because we love the liturgy and the preaching and stuff like that. I said, uh, this is something I heard 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's new and, ground. Well, maybe it's Florida, or maybe it's just the change in the American culture, but I would say over half of my congregation, when they come to Florida, didn't come as Episcopalians. Mm-hmm. I was, you know, if I look at my vestry, you know, a quarter of them have to get confirmed before they can sit on the vestry because they were, well, received because they were sure. confirmed as Catholics or as Presbyterians or Lutherans, and they settle into a new community, look around, try their old denomination, and eh, we don't like that church, let's try this one my neighbor goes to, we like it, we stay. There's no brand loyalty in America anymore towards religion. There is at the... Well, that's not an exclusive statement. There are some people who will only go to a Catholic church, who will only go to an Episcopal, who will only go to an ACNA. But I would venture a guess that the majority shop and find something that is where they feel that the Lord is at work. It's not that they're looking for something to accommodate their desires. It's not a Chinese menu, you know, one of these, one of those. Yeah. (laughs) But rather, where do we feel the Lord is at work in our hearts and do we feel part of this family? Right. And denomination is way down the list. I would say the denominationalism of the 70s or 50s to 70s, that's over. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go to small uh, town farm community in Minnesota where the Methodist Church had one block the Lutheran Church had another block, and the Roman Catholic Church was set up on another block. Those days are over. Mm. Two of those churches are currently empty. You know? Well, it's just like you were able to your your new congregation was able to purchase an old church building. Not that it's church, yeah. Um, old, yeah. yeah. Um, fact: two people. I have two new people uh, who've officially joined. One of them is a retired Methodist minister or pastor. He retired down here to Florida from Alabama, and he tells me, you know, we're going through what you guys went through, and I'd rather just get away from all that and uh, try you guys for a while and make fun of you as you preach. (laughs) You guys, you guys are the Episcopalians. You guys are led, led by presiding Bishop Michael Curry, who happens to be, uh, have more melanin in his skin than myself. And he would refer to himself as an African-American. And if you don't know, if you haven't turned the TV on or gone on the Internet, there has been another uh, citizen killed by police officer. The citizen was black uh, and he was killed by five black uh, police officers beaten to death. It was horrible. If you watch the video, you if you're not sickened, you need to talk to your, your priest. It was very sickening. Michael Curry, I don't know if you watched the video, but he had an opinion about this. And darn it all, George, your your presiding bishop is able to find racism where there is none. Wow. Oh, Kevin, we need to... Somebody did take an editor's pen and remove the phrase white racism yes. from his press statement following the death of uh, Tyree Nichols. Uh Nichols uh, was stopped, pulled over by police for a traffic violation, took off, fled, fought with the police, and the police, uh, according to the video, and I don't believe videos anymore, to be frank, uh, videos was beaten to death by uh, the five officers who attempted to subdue him, subdue him. The police chief of Memphis is black. The city is 65% black. The five mm-hmm. officers were black. Nichols is black. This is a black on black crime. Five men beating a, another black man to death happens how many times each weekend in Chicago? This time it was the police acting with brutality. Nobody's defending the police here. They were obviously badly trained. Memphis is uh, hired. The police chief is, uh, is, uh, really into diversity, inclusion, and equity, and the standards to increase the number of of racial minority officers were dropped, and so they have police... Significantly dropped. Those who had previous run-ins with the police uh, for 
uh, misdemeanor crimes were now being considered. Yeah. Now, so here's the situation. So Michael Curry releases a statement about the horror. Franklin Graham released a statement. And if you compare the two, neither use the phrase white racism, but Franklin Graham talked about sin mm -hmm. and violence and how we as a society can and must and should do better. M Michael Curry tried to say the same thing, but he started off with the litany, going back to lynchings and all the black men murdered by white police officers without saying the word black men and white police officers. He goes through the, the, if you will, the script that is in his head and then adds Tyree Nichols to this list of young black men exploited by the society and uh, systematic, systemic racism. This and that. Yeah. So, he, no, he did. Uh, Curry didn't go overboard like some of these kooks on uh, the talk TV news shows, seeing black, ra seeing white racism everywhere. But I think it was more due to an editor's pen than a realization that the song he's singing isn't isn't uh, the product he's pitching isn't selling because it's uh, it's yesterday's product. Well, I mean, we had. We had a, a white, we had a black policeman, two mm -hmm. black policemen killed two white women on January 6th at the Capitol. One shot, uh, a Capitol policeman shot one woman to death who was unarmed, and a second black police woman beat to death with a billy club a white woman. And we don't have, and though both of those were police brutalities, but the same people who are crying out. Uh, about police brutality are silent about these because these were, of course, white conservatives, and you can you can kill them um, with apparently impunity. Well, hold on a second. Whoopi Goldberg just said yesterday, maybe it's time uh, for white people to be beaten so that this will finally stop. That we'll finally have an end to this, and that doesn't end sin. That doesn't end brokenness. And white people do get beaten by the cops. Uh, I, my county is uh, ninety. My county is ninety-eight percent white. Mm -hmm. I think your county is almost that level. Uh, probably, yeah. And and uh, we have uh, good old boys getting their heads beaten in by the police for yeah. getting fights with the cops when they're high on drugs and alcohol. Uh, Bubba and Frankie. It's, it's, get beat before they get thrown into the county jail every friday night after they had uh, 10 or 12 beers yeah drink 10 or 12 beers beat their wife tossing beers out the the window when they're driving down the road uh and then running when the police finally pull them over they're gonna get you know uh some batons and some trips and some zaps that's it's the florida way regardless of your skin color yeah and now the florida way now that i have five children the two I previously had, and the three I, and three I just got, mm -hmm. who I need to find foster care because mommy and daddy are in jail. Uh, well, is that, and that's a sad can thing. I, yeah, this is Go how ahead. smart some of these. Uh, the guy, a friend of his, said, "You know that ice chest cooler outside of the Dollar General? They're getting rid of it. You, you don't want it anymore." So he looted it up on his pipe on his pickup truck and drove away with it. Well. No, Dollar General, he's, how could you be so stupid? How could you be so stupid? Well, now, and his wife has a drug problem, and so now I've got three more kids, good Episcopalians, who I need to find foster care for. Mm. Uh, audience, there's an audience of thousands of people. What a great opportunity to pray for a, a Georgia situation in his church. And for those uh, kids who need foster care, because uh, if there's anything the church is called Dexter. to do, yeah, go ahead. Dexter, mm -hmm. Luna, Lily, Ryan, and Randy. Little boys and girls under the age of uh, oldest of those five or seven. And because of drugs and because of alcohol, um, we're having to basically try to save them. I mean, one of the five-year-olds isn't even toilet train because the parents would rather, rather, you know, hey, I gave birth to you. My job's done. Let me let me pursue my habit. Which their parents did to them. 
Yeah, that, that this is a if if there's one thing you learn uh, in uh, having ministry for foster care and ministry for uh, broken families is it's a generational problem, and mm. you, you, at some point you need to be able to stop that. And we know with Christ that can be stopped, but it ain't easy. And and see, yeah. Kevin, you're right because there are members of these families, different families, mm. who have been saved by the church, have been saved by a relationship with Jesus Christ, who have found community in the church, and for their relatives who continue in the pathology of dysfunction. The way forward is not government services; it's Jesus Christ and a church community that will bring these people into their into their fellowship, and not condemn them, not denounce them, not say, "Oh, you're a bad mother because your child isn't." trained at five but rather love you mm -hmm. and help you and quietly affirm how these things can and should be done um so in some respects this is the wonderful part of being a minister because you help change people's lives where it really really matters because and right they have now, a relationship with jesus christ and right now god trusts your church and your leadership enough to uh, provide you with foster children so uh, kudos and uh, you are in our prayers uh, for sure let's move on to other news uh, Pope Francis and Justin Welby the Archbishop of Canterbury are en route to Sudan to help solve problems and this is not a video uh, portion where George and I are complaining about any of this we support church leaders doing functions like this to draw attention to the nature of Christ in solving these problems. So, what's going on, George? Well, Francis and Welby and the moderator of the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian leader, were to have gone to South Sudan last year, but Francis got sick. Mm -hmm. And there was to be a Congo-South Sudan visit. Well, the schedules were redone, and Francis is going to Kinshasa in the Congo to support the... Uh, Catholic Church, and then he's going to meet uh, Justin Welby and the moderator of the Church of Scotland in Juba in South Sudan. Congo uh, is in a terrible mess. Uh, just this past weekend, 18 people were killed by Islamist jihadists in Ituri province. Uh, the week, two weeks before, was it? Two weeks before, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, a suicide bomber uh, set off an explosion killing uh, it was 20 when we reported. It's probably risen from the, those dying from their injuries. And so Francis is going to start off in the Congo and then join uh, his counterparts in ecumenical visit in South Sudan, which is beset by tribal rivalries and by the predations of uh, militant Islam in the north from Sudan and in the... and. Africa's newest nation is having a very rocky youth. And these three men coming together, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, sharing the call to love your neighbor, not look at your neighbor as I'm, I'm a, uh, a, a Noor and he's a Dinka and I'm a member of this tribe and you're a member of that tribe, or I'm an Anglican and you're a Catholic, but we're all brothers and sisters made in the image of God. That's a wonderful thing. And I, I, I hail Justin Welby and Pope Francis and the moderator whose name I've forgotten mm -hmm. for doing this work to uh, help change the world and bring God's kingdom a tiny bit closer. I would also pray it would be a wonderful experience for uh, Pope Francis and Justin Welby and uh, increase their faith as well because uh, this is where we need to figure out we're all on the same side here. We're on the same side of the human race, created members uh, of God's wonderful kingdom. So it, it's hard to watch, but uh, keep those men in your prayers. On to some more news. Um, Steven Sizer has finally got his uh, uh, verdict. It was uh, a couple of months ago. Sentencing is now. We've had a long uh, relationship with Steven Sizer. I've met him a couple times in my travels. Um, He's written to me uh, personally through some emails back and forth over the decades. Um, and he is a character uh, within the uh, Church of England. He has been sentenced now for uh, some of his anti-Semitic actions. 
and I thought we could talk about that. Um, and on a, on a professional note here, uh, Steven Sizer in the past has uh, had his lawyers contact us uh, demanding things be taken off our site that he said was defamatory or libelous. Um, and we did not take those off the site because clearly they weren't. And clearly uh, the laws of uh, Britain do not reach us here in um, the United States because we have freedom of speech. And Obama passed a law that allows it so they can't sue anybody here who's in journalism. So we're safe that way. So, but let's talk about Steven Sizer, George. Last month, December, Steven Sizer was found guilty on four charges of the 11 brought against him of making anti Semitic utterances and offending the Jewish community, specifically for uh, posting uh, tweets about, uh, posting articles about 9 11 slash Israel you know essentially saying was it a jewish conspiracy uh sharing a platform with holocaust denier and hamas people and sending out articles and opinion pieces that the british jewish community felt to be offensive and anti-semitic and they filed 2018 they filed a complaint with the church a clergy disciplinary measure proceedings were launched and Stephen Sizer, who had retired as rector of Christ Church, Virginia Water, in the suburbs of London's southwest corner, uh, was uh, suspended. And the trial was held, and he was found uh, guilty. And he was also chastised for being disingenuous in his responses. So they then they hit it. Then on Monday, they released his penalty. There was a hearing in London, and he was given 12 years uh, suspension of the right to be exercise ministry. But they gave him credit for time served, so he only is suspended until 2030. He's 68 years old now, so he'll be 75 before he can put a collar back on. Now, I should say, uh, I, should say I, for many years, was a cons correspondent for the Jerusalem Post. And I am a, uh, I have strong views on Israel, of supportive and of Christian Jewish relations. So I disagree greatly with almost everything he says about Israel. I don't like the apartheid state arguments, I reject them. But Kevin, I don't like the idea of suspending somebody for speaking. For, yeah, for your speech. Yeah. Now, we, but we say this as Americans, we enjoy a very robust freedom of speech, even in, in the age of wokeness, even when they're cramming CRT down the throats of our children and our uh, employees at, at workplaces and our government, we still enjoy, except at the university level, let me be real cl clear, a robust freedom of speech. I'm allowed to, um, in public forum, not be arrested for reading the Bible, for praying uh, aloud or in thought uh, for doing things that are protected by the First Amendment. That does not apply worldwide, and it certainly doesn't apply within Britain. And so, well, go ahead. Well, with Anglican Inc., for instance, we post stuff from Colin Coward all the time. Hmm. Uh, less, less article. Colin is uh, basically jumped into the Anglican unscripted world. He's starting his own uh, video vlog. Vlog, 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 yes. Yeah. Unadulterated love. Now, Kevin and I have known Co Colin in person since what? How long, Kevin? It says my, my hour and 20 minute taxi ride where Colin had to sit in my lap because there was not enough room in the taxi in Alexandria, Egypt. Egypt. I'm not um, a homophobe. Huh? <laughs> I do not agree. I think Colin has succumbed to a Gnostic heresy, making himself the center and his views and God's given him special revelation. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested to hear what he has to say. And therefore, that's why we put people up like Colin Coward on Anglican Unscripted and a number of people who I profoundly disagree with. Now, Kevin and I didn't write the thing that Stephen Sizer was objecting to that was written by uh, two English uh, Englishmen. 
but they have an absolute right to be heard in their criticisms of Stephen Sizer and Colin Coward. I'm not going to tell him to, I may think, man, you're stupid, but you have a right to be stupid. And I think it's in my worldview, I want to hear these things so that I can judge for myself. And now it's one thing for a bishop to say, knock it off. Uh, you know, don't say well, these things if you want to be on my team. But it's another thing to punish unpopular views because, see, here's the thing. Justin Welby put in a little comment after the verdict was read out where he's talking about the need to be nice to Jewish people. I agree with that. But I don't think silencing Stephen Sizer, uh is, is being nice to Jewish people. I think there are things that the Justin Welby could do vis-a-vis uh, -vis his talk about Israel all the time, that Israel's a state that's persecuting Christians when that's not true. But, you know, it's a cheap out. It is a cheap out. But, you know, even in, in Scripture, uh, the only time I can think of Jesus telling somebody to shut up was the demon. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it... I am wiser because of all the people I get to talk with to and all the different opinions I get to hear. And because I operate in the plane that has a Holy Spirit, I'm able to discern and decipher and understand what is right here based on tradition and reason and scripture and what is just off blank. Like, you know, the Church of England is not using reason, scripture, tradition or anything we'll discuss that in our last story in this this new uh, progress they're going through and that but so when i sit down with especially my travels with campers around the world i'm sitting down with a a, a buddhist who clearly doesn't know what they're talking about. they don't they don't understand buddhism first of all and they certainly don't understand christianity but you get there and you, you get to talk to them and you you provide i get to provide my opinion he provides his opinion and uh it just it's it's a great way to to become wiser i say now some people may take offense at this but i firmly believe uh hate the sin love the sinner um my job is to love stephen sizer colin coward and those, michael curry justin mm -hmm. welby my job is to love them as people pray for them seek god's will for their lives but i can disagree with what they say and do my failing is that at times I allow my disappointment to cloud my discussion of the person, and I never really want to do that. Um, now, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, all right. Yeah, we don't need to get too interpersonal. This show is about Anglicanism, George. Let me pull up my show notes. Uh, so that's about it on Stephen Sire. He has a, a sentence that you said a suspended sentence. Well, he's never served in prison. Okay. He, he's just no. A, no. <laughs> no, he just can't hold himself out or exercise the ministry of the Church of England. Okay. But he's retired anyway, and it doesn't touch his pension. So don't cry for me, Argentina. Yeah, don't cry. All right. Living, love, and faith, and all the other fun things that go with that. Ad, uh, uh, let's just talk about you know some of the responses here and what's going to happen and what we don't know is going to happen. This is our final story, and I'll just call it Living Love and Faith. Now, I need to be, to back up here and as a Christian, uh, as a person who uh, believes that this all works out now and in the end through a relationship with Christ. And I can't think of a time any time that the LGTB community has been worse served by the church. Now they're being openly lied to. They're being told that what they practice in their bedroom uh, is not sinful and can be blessed, and that those type of relationships uh, are of God now. And this is this is a lie. This is a, a lie. Uh, take it whatever level of hell you want. Um, this is this is a lie that is going to damn people um, for eternity. And they're so you are being unserved 
and ill-served and the shame this brings on them and the church is unfathomable. I just want to start with that before we get into the rest of it here. Uh, the church is lying to the LGTB community. That said, the House of Bishops uh, met and said, we don't care about the reactions going on. We don't care about what George and Kevin say. We don't care about all the conservative bishops in the Church of England. We don't care about the letters we're getting from the Global South or GAFCON. We think we can go forward with this with no problem, George. Well, since we last spoke on this on Friday, there have been more developments. The Association of Deans, some of them, I think 27 deans of the cathedrals of England signed a letter saying, isn't this wonderful? And led by David Monteith, the new dean of Canterbury, who's a partnered gay man, said, I can't wait to get married and all this and stuff. Then uh, we've had certain statements and uh, the, the Bishop of South, uh, Southwest Eastern Mexico, you know, who's the liberal bishop in that church said, yeah, I can't wait to do gay marriage here. And I, uh, salute you and so, so we've had that and we've had conservative reactions from the global south and the agafcon but so the, what we had and i just it's important to keep the timeline here on sunday the a new organization called orthodox uh, anglicans anglican orthodox orthodox yes uh ao not orthodox anglicans but anglican orthodox where the orthodox is an adjective modifying the word Anglican. They uh, led uh, their their uh, spokesman is Paul Eddy, who is the Global South Fellowship of Anglican spokesman. They've basically announced a coalition to push back within the Church of England, and they urged parishes to fight the good fight, and they gave concrete examples of how you fight. You stop sending money to the diocese. You only send the money needed to pay the clergy salaries. Anything else you put into a good steward's trust. You set up a local trust to support poor conservative congregations. If your local cathedral, now that we know that some of the deans are really out there and happy to have gay marriages, you just tell the bishop, I'm sorry, I cannot go to any uh, event held at the cathedral because they they practice uh, things that we believe, as Kevin said, lead to damnation. So you use the financial lever, you use your uh, ecclesiastical levers. Every time the budget comes up, you basically challenge points of it, which you believe will further the work of Satan in the world rather than building the kingdom of Christ. So this came out on Sunday. And on Monday, we saw one of the major evangelical parishes essentially sign up. St. Helen's Bishopgate sent a letter, uh, which is a mega uh, evangelical S parish in the city of London, near the Tower of London, that part of the city, um, has had a long preaching ministry, teaching ministry. It's just uh, one of the it churches, if you will sent a letter to Sarah Mullally basically endorsing the global the glo endorsing the Anglican Orthodox statement and it's a little bit of surprise because although St. Helens has always been Orthodox has always been in the right they've never wanted to play with the other people other children in the sandbox the Church of England's uh, evangelical in public, conservative in public. In pu in, in, the Church in of England's conservatives play badly with each other mm -hmm. Every man wants to be king. Nobody wants to be part of a coalition unless they're in charge, unless their views take precedence. Mm -hmm. And St. Helens has always sort of stood off and, you know, been its own little world, the way Holy Trinity Brompton has always sort of stood to one side. Well, no longer. They are joining up and are now part of this Watt Briar coalition. They'll withhold money from the Diocese of London. They won't be participating. And one of the main things that being asked, being put forward by Anglican Orthodox is alternative Episcopal oversight. Munir Anis, the former primate of Alexandria, Bishop of Egypt, uh, is essentially going to offer alternative oversight. Now, Munir didn't do this the first time round with the flying bishops in America. Munir held back. And now 
He's no longer holding back. In the Global South, primates are not holding back. And so Munir, who's retired, has more time than the active primates, but he can do this. And so we're seeing massive movement. Meanwhile, the same day, on the 30th, as Kevin mentioned yesterday, the bishops met again at the Church of England to basically discuss the responses and the way forward. And they basically said, we're going to double down and keep doing this, but we will have committees uh, which where we'll try to draw upon the breadth and diversity of the Church of England on these issues. Yeah. So they're going to they're going to rob. Well, they're going to push people into talking about this till they're blue in the faith. But they're going to do what they're going to do. Uh, no, they're not going to push talking anymore. Uh, the the indaba process is over. We got what we want. We don't need to talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so we will have discussions with you where we are the the primary principal in that discussion. But we're not going back. We got what we wanted, and. The interesting thing here is we read their papers. They re we read their 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 understanding of this theologically, and it it's bunk. It's lower than bunk, uh, because I saw better uh, defense of an LGBTQ lifestyle in the age of Rowan Williams when he had his talks. They 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 kind of lost that edge. As far as tradition, that they, they, they have nothing to show in tradition where this is something that the, the church should endorse. As far as reason, they offer exi none, no good reason at all that a reasonable person would look at and say, "Oh, that, you know, that makes sense." It's 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 like watching a church go dystopian. It is what I'm seeing here. The, the Church of England has gone dystopian, where. The lawyers are the theologians, George. The yeah. Church of England lawyers and, are the new theologians. And these criticisms are coming from both left and right. I just I summarized in little bullet points for my own benefit mm -hmm. the, where the criticisms are. As you mentioned, there's no theology here. Mm -hmm. Rowan Williams did a great job trying to articulate best, but they've passed by Rowan Williams' arguments. Rowan Williams is passé. There's no theology. There's no scriptural engagement, true engagement, other than proof texting and the most basic God is love, you know, sort of stuff. Lo love and thy neighbor is... Love, the, lo yeah, yeah. They, they basically are outsourcing to the lawyers, you know, what we can and can't do. It's unconstitutional. They're saying, well, we don't need to bother talking to Synod about this. We can just do it as bishops. Basically, they're saying we didn't even need to bother with all this because we could have done it anyway. Uh, from the left, there's no pastoral care and oversight to the gay community. Basically, they're being told it's still second best. It's still pretend. In other words, this half measure of holy matrimony is not the same thing as marriage. We don't buy that nonsense. And that's coming from both left and right. Um I've been trying to get my head around all this. Where is this coming from? And I'm going to use words that people may find objectionable, but is this demonic? No. In other words, the, the, is this being done with malice? In other words, intentionally or no, the outcomes that we've seen from Justin Welby have made things worse over the years. Was this deliberate malice? Is this demonic? And and of and is in my own prayer life. I said no. I would choose a different word, and that's Luciferian, Lucifer. Now people say, well, what's the difference? I said, well, something that is demonic seeks to worship Satan and evil. Lu something that's Luciferian seeks to worship yourself, just as Lucifer's sin was pride. When I hear Justin Welby say, I am in supporting these blessings, but I will not do it myself because I need to be a focus of unity. I hear the word, I need, I must, I, I, I. I am the measure of all things. The most important thing in the church is the I, I, Justin Welby. I am making God in my image. And this is part of my criticism of uh, Colin Coward's thoughts and Jane Ozan. Jane Ozan has been on Twitter putting out some really outrageous statements of uh, on and she is one of the leaders of the gay activists and she is the the woman who led the group that sort of rallied outside of Lambeth uh, Palace 
uh, demanding Justin Welby give them what they want. Her, the, the level of anger and vitriol is so powerful coming from them. And it is, this is my experience. I'm subject to constant death threats. I'm this, I'm that. If, if you don't agree with me, you're insulting me. And by insulting me, I need Justin Welby to discipline you. These are Luciferian issues where they're making themselves the measure of all things. They're not allowing their wills or lives to be conformed to Jesus Christ. But, but they're also oh. admitting the lie. Mm -hmm. Justin Welby admitted to the lie that having same-sex blessings will unite the church. Okay? I can't do it because it will not be uniting. I can't do it because it will show disunity. I can't do it because it is wrong. Mm -hmm. If this were something right and holy and godly, by darn it, Justin Welby should say, of course I will do this, and I will do this proudly. No, he admits that this is, this is wrong, and I hope sometime in the next week or so, he wakes up in the horror of the night through the conviction of the Holy Spirit to say, I was wrong. We are leading people to damnation. We need to stop. It's, it's very important, I believe. Kevin, you're absolutely right. I mean, and everybody can make that turn at the last moment. But when you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, when you put yourself in the place of Christ and the Spirit and God the Father in all things, sometimes you become what they call a reprobate. So pardoned in your sin, the damnation because of your pride. The emotions and feelings are not a measure by which we judge the truth of God. In other words, if it makes if, if if I'm happy, that's not a sign that God is with me. If I'm sad, it's not a sign that God's against me. One of the things we know from the great saints and the great mystics is that you know, suffering accompanies our walk in the Christian life because we're being purified and we're having those things burned away and we bear our sufferings as Christ bore our suff sufferings when he took them on the cross. And I just this, well, I, I'm not as articulate as Gavin Ashton did on these points, but this egotistical uh, worldview that I am the measure of all things, the, the modernism that began with Rousseau has just taken us to this point where we can now, oh, one of your favorite topics, Kevin, on my Twitter feed this morning, that young man, or that young boy, who is is now the Connecticut State Women's Track uh, Star of the Year. You, you know, they're starting the season early in Connecticut, and he's yeah. just clobbering yeah, why, everybody why, why, else. He's 30, he's gonna, 40 yards ahead. He's going to get these scholarships. He's going to get scholarships that were set aside for women. And, uh, but here, but, so, he, but he, we don't, yeah. we have a society where we can't even say, you know, trust the science, except when we talk about chromosomes and DNA. Yeah. If I feel this, if I feel I'm a woman and I'm a rapist with moral convictions and I feel I'm a woman, so I need to be sent to women's prison so I can rape and assault women more, that trumps the reality of God's creation, that you are a man, you are a woman. And yes, but for the one person who likes to write in about that, there are such people, one in a million or whatever the rate is, who have... Asexual uh, uh, genitalia, uh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. yeah, so th that does That's, exist, but that is not the standard by which we judge the world. No. Um, well, no, here's the standard with which I hate to belittle the Church of England on this, but this is where they stand. Mm -hmm. It is godly, and we know it's godly because we got away with it. Mm -hmm. That's that's exactly right now where the leadership of the Church of England is. We can vote this through because they believed us. We got away with it. Not everybody believed them, but they did get away with it. The Church of England will now, uh, after Synod, be able to bless same-sex uh, relationships and same-sex marriages. 
the well, other church. There's no reason why they can't, there's no reason why they can't do it now because the bishops have said synod is irrelevant to our process. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And how to stop it would be if somebody mounted a legal challenge and challenged the lawyer's farcical farcical uh, argument that matrimony is not the same thing as marriage. Um, there's been Martin Davies had a paper tearing this apart from a legal, theological, and logical position. Mm. And it, it won't stand under any serious scrutiny unless you've got a uh, crooked uh, uh, judicial process. Um, yeah. But we, so, and I, in our adult education yesterday, you know, we talk about these things. Uh, I've been running a series for late, ever since we got back in from COVID, I've been doing, uh, taking an issue in the news and then getting six or seven passages from scripture and looking at the issue from that scriptural perspective. Some are sort of low key, like the you know, here's an article from Buffalo about that guy who rescued a dozen people, broke into a school uh, and saved all these people who would have died. And so we talked about the Good Samaritan and had all those passages, but got, you know, how, how do we view this issue? And we, we got into the, uh, you know, the, the transgenderism yesterday, male, and we looked at this through the scriptural lens. What is the God telling us through scripture? How do we understand this? And somebody said, George, I just get so depressed because it seems to me that Christendom, Christianity is finished. And I said, you're half right. Christendom, meaning the medieval system where we're all assumed to be Christian, that's done. But I think Christianity is only just beginning. We've got a world to conquer and it's great that we are now refocusing our energies instead of being an arm of the state like the Church of England, where we basically have to collude with the authorities and the dirty business of government, we can be free to speak God's truth to any and all. And I think the church is just beginning its battle. Oh, absolutely. Why, yeah, else, think... why else, Kevin, would you invest in being in a member of a, of a new but ancient group, the ACNA? if you didn't think the future is going to be with Christ? I think the near immediate future in the next 10 years, there's going to be much suffering within the church. I mm -hmm. think there's going to be an overreach by wokeism and an overreach by uh, uber liberals and overreach by governments to silence and uh, punish and persecute Christi Christians in mainline Western countries, including America. You know, I, well, th see, I think we've reached that point now where um, that is something you, 20 years ago, <laughs> never. Well, let's take, let's take maybe. The, the example. Let's take the example of these just essentially two dysfunctional families I've mentioned uh, with uh, five children needing foster care. Maybe 75 years ago, they would have all naturally been in church, mm -hmm. you know, but that's but the 60s killed that off, and so they're now two or three generations into social dysfunction. But there's still one person in the family that said the church is where these kids need to be. The church can help you through this. God is there. And people watch what Christians do and what they see us doing. Well, this is my hope. What they see us doing and loving, not judging these parents and children, but engaging with them where they are taking them on that journey to love and wholeness, I think that will change the world. One person, one family at a time. In 10 years time, when these kids are teenagers and they've been confirmed and then they'll never come back again till they're married, that's a joke. Uh, how many more members of that family or their neighbors or their community will see what's different about those people, what's happened in their lives and maybe I can find that too. Uh, and this is when I say Christianity is just beginning its walk in, in the world and society. Uh, when it's a social conformity, when it's tribal, when, uh, you know, I'm a Protestant, I'm a Catholic, and that's about it. I'm just not them. That's not the true church. The true church, I believe, is people living out their faith, starting from that foundation of knowledge of Christ in in their lives. 
I and hope I don't sound no, kooky no, when hey, I say let that. Let me let me finish it up. We're, we just went over an hour, so we're going to finish up here. If you, as a priest, stand up at the pulpit on a Sunday morning and you look over your church and you see foster kids, orphans, widows, poor, um, good. You're doing a very good job, and God is well pleased. I'm Kevin yeah, but, Coulson. Oh, go ahead. And and in, in addition to the the widows, the poor, the orphan. I'd like to see a few bankers, bankers, few yes. <laughs> real estate entrepreneurs. They need Jesus too. <laughs> they need Jesus too, and I need a new roof or will shortly. But who are you? <laughs> That's right. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I am George Conger, and you have been watching episode 785 of Anglican Unscripted.